Black Beauty, Part 2, Chapter 22, Earl's Hall. The next morning after breakfast, Joe put Mary Legs into the mistress's low chaise to take him to the vicarage. He came first and said goodbye to us, and Mary Legs neighed to us from the yard. Then John put the saddle on Ginger and the leading rein on me and rode us across the country about 15 miles to Earl's Hall Park, where the Earl of W lived. There was a very fine house and a great deal of stabling. We went into the yard through a stone gateway and John asked for Mr. York. It was some time before he came. He was a fine looking middle-aged man and his voice said at once that he expected to be obeyed. He was very friendly and polite to John and after giving us a slight look, he called a groom to take us to our boxes and invited John to take some refreshment. We were taken to a light, airy stable and placed in boxes adjoining each other, where we were rubbed down and fed. In about half an hour, John and Mr. York, who was to be our new coachman, came in to see us. Now, Mr. Manley, he said after carefully looking at us both, I can see no fault in these horses, but we all know that horses have their peculiarities as well as men, and that sometimes they need different treatment. I should like to know if there's anything particular in either of these that you would like to mention. Well, said John, I don't believe there is a better pair of horses in the country and right grieved I am to part with them, but they are not alike. The black one is the most perfect temper I ever knew. I suppose he has never known a hard word or a blow since he was foaled and all his pleasure seems to be to do what you wish, but the chestnut, I fancy, must have had bad treatment. We heard as much from the dealer. She came to us snappish and suspicious, but when she found what sort of place ours was, it all went off by degrees. For three years, I have never seen the smallest sign of temper, and if she is well treated, there is not a better, more willing animal than she is. But she is naturally a more irritable constitution than the black horse. Flies tease her more. Anything wrong in the harness frets her more. And if she were ill-used or unfairly treated, she would not be unlikely to give tit for tat. You know that many high-mettled horses will do so. Of course, said York. I quite understand. But you know, it is not easy in stables like these to have all the grooms just what they should be. I, I do my best and there I must leave it. I'll remember what you have said about the mare. They were going out of the stable when John stopped and said, I had better mention that we have never used the check rein with either of them. The black horse never had one on and the dealer said it was the gag bit that spoiled the other's temper. Well, said York, if they come here, they must wear the check rein. I prefer a loose rein myself and his lordship is always very reasonable about horses, but my lady, that's another thing. She will have style and if her carriage horses are not reined up tight, she wouldn't look at them. I always stand out against the gag bit and shall do so, but it must be tied up when my lady rides. I'm sorry for it, very sorry, said John, but I must go now or I shall lose the train. He came round to each of us to pat and speak to us for the last time. His voice sounded very sad. I held my face close to him. That was all I could do to say goodbye. And then he was gone and I have never seen him since. The next day, Lord W. came to look at us. He seemed very pleased with our appearance. I have great confidence in these horses, he said, from the character my friend Mr. Gordon has given me of them. Of course, they are not a match in color, but my idea is that they will do very well for the carriage while we are all in the country. Before we go to London, I must try to match Baron, the black horse, I believe is perfect for riding. York then told him what John had said about us. Well, he said, you must keep an eye to the mare and put the check rein easy. I dare say they will do very well with a little humoring at first. I'll mention it to your lady. In the afternoon, we were harnessed and put in the carriage. And as the stable clock struck three, we were led around to the front of the house. It was all very grand and three or four times larger as the house at Old Birtwick, but not half so pleasant if a horse may have an opinion. Two footmen were standing ready dressed in drab livery with scarlet breeches and white stockings. Presently, we heard the rustling sound of silk as my lady came down the flight of stone steps. She stepped round to look at us. She was a tall, proud looking woman and did not seem pleased about something, but she said nothing and got into the carriage. 
This was the first time of wearing a check rein. And I must say though, it certainly was a nuisance not to be able to get my head down now and then. It did not pull my head higher than I was accustomed to carry it. I felt anxious about Ginger, but she seemed to be quiet and content. The next day at three o'clock, we were again at the door and the footman as before, we heard the silk dress rustle and the lady came down the steps. And in an imperious voice, she said, York, you must put those horses head higher. They are not fit to be seen. York got down and said very respectfully, I beg your pardon, my lady, but these horses have not been reined up for three years and my Lord said it would be safer to bring them to it by degrees. But if your ladyship pleases, I can take them up a little more. Do so, she said. Your came round to her heads and shortened the rein himself, one hole, I think. Every little makes a difference, be it for better or worse, and that day we had a steep hill to go up. Then I began to understand what I had heard of. Of course, I wanted to put my head forward and take the carriage up with a will, as we had been used to do, but no, I had to pull my head up now and that took all the spirit out of me and the strain came on my back and legs. When we came in, Ginger said, now you see what it is like, but this is not bad. And if it does not get much worse than this, I shall say nothing about it for we are very well treated here. But if they strain me up tight, why let them look out. I can't bear it and I won't. Day by day, hole by hole, our bearing rings were shortened and instead of looking forward with pleasure to having my harness put on as I used to do, I began to dread it. Ginger too seemed restless, though she said very little. At last, I thought the worst was over. For several days, there was no more shortening, and I determined to make the best of it and do my duty, though it was now a constant harass instead of a pleasure. But the worst was not come.